When they planned the streets of our cities with nothing but horses in mind, they put their automobile-loving descendants in quite a jam, a traffic jam. Narrow downtown streets, originally designed for horses and buggies, cannot handle today's volume of vehicles. This is Boston. And the story is the same in all our great American cities. We are 100 to 200 years too late to change the street plans of our metropolitan business district. to drive is one of our cherished freedoms, but it doesn't mean much in a jam like this. As one joker said, you could run out of gas here and cross the bridge without knowing it. So, what are we going to do about the situation? We can't do without our downtown business districts because we need centralized areas for the municipal, financial, and mercantile affairs of our city. Families may move to the suburbs to get more living space, but this outward movement simply reflects the vast growth of our national population. More and more people now live in the suburbs. But record high populations live, work, and shop within the corporate limits of our great city. So that more than ever before, we need our downtown business districts and a better means of going to and from them. Brother, what a problem. The population keeps growing. 10,000 new cars keep being born every day, and the streets remain the same size. Here is 34th Street, New York, as it was photographed a generation ago. And here it is today. So, what are we going to do? Some people say, widen the streets, make room for more cars. Fine. Let's move the Empire State Building back 10 feet. That'll give us an extra traffic lane. Or, how about widening the other side? Street widening is a good idea when it can be done. They widened and reconstructed Michigan Avenue, Detroit in 1942, adding two lanes to relieve the jam. It cost $3,865,000. Here it is after the widening. Widening does help. It is worthwhile. Streets should be widened wherever possible in congested districts. But street widening is no answer in itself. The same thing is true of expressways. We need these big multiple lane arteries to handle the enormous flow of traffic. Yet wonderful as they are, they alone cannot solve traffic congestion. Fifty-five miles per hour is permitted on this expressway. But what good does fifty-five miles per hour do these stalled and fuming motorists 
as they creep bumper to bumper as they leave the expressway. And here we have the great Hollywood Freeway, which slices through mountainous hills to connect the city of Los Angeles with the heavily populated San Fernando Valley. But how free are these Californians on the freeway as they crawl foot by foot through the canyon? Because the heart of America's fourth largest city still has most of its downtown streets in the narrow historic pattern of the past, entirely inadequate for the traffic of today. The original common law of England decreed that the King's Highway is not to be used as a stable yard. That's right, no parking on the road. News of this principle, however, does not seem to have crossed the ocean. Many, many of America's busiest streets are being used as stable yards. The flow of traffic on this street would be almost doubled by the elimination of street stabling and would be the equivalent of a street widening job costing millions of dollars. But every motorist who fights his way into the heart of the city feels entitled to a hero's reward, a parking place. Parking places can be privately or publicly built at a cost of about $4,000 per car space. This new public lot in Detroit, for instance, will have a capacity of 1,025 cars, a tiny fraction of all the vehicles that flow through the heart of the city. Experts figure that another 800,000 parking places would solve the downtown parking problem in all our cities. Yet if all 800,000 could be provided overnight, the terrible problem of traffic congestion in these business districts would be made worse, not better. More people than ever would drive downtown, choking the streets with still more traffic because the streets must remain the same size. Many city planners and traffic engineers reached a point of complete despair trying to fit millions of 20th century automobiles into 18th century street plans. But now they are beginning to realize there is one good and obvious solution. Shift the emphasis to moving people instead of vehicles. After all, the whole reason for a central business district is to provide a meeting place and a work center for people. It is people who buy and sell the merchandise in the shops and stores. People who are moving on their feet, not on wheels. It is people who do the work and manage the city. People who eat the meals, patronize the hotel, and attend the theaters. What's more, there's plenty of room for people downtown, even at the peaks of the major shopping seasons. And it's people in the heart of the city, not vehicles, that buy the goods and services. And here's a significant thing. A person only occupies a space of about four square feet. An automobile needs close to 96. The automobile takes up 24 times as much space as the person. The drivers and all of the passengers in this so-called rush hour scene can be comfortably seated in just one modern motor coach. When the passengers alight, they present no parking problem. Neither does the motor coach. It moves on to serve other people. This is the amount of off-street parking space required for the cars of 34 automobile drivers who carry an average of 17 passengers, $150,000 worth of land and service facilities. The 51 people carried by these cars can all be seated in one motor coach.
Or look at this. The drivers and passengers of all the cars stabled on both sides of this street for two blocks can be comfortably seated in just one motor coach. City planners have invested billions of public funds to build traffic arteries that lead into the heart of the city. Yet everything they've done has hardly kept them abreast of the problem because they've been unable to use traffic arteries for the mass movement of people. They have invested millions for big, beautiful expressways. And millions more in street widening, only to have the extra lanes bottled up by still more private cars fighting their way downtown. Traffic engineers have tried street signals with electronic brains that count traffic with electric eyes, and even have electronic memories to keep track of the number of cars on the red. They have spent millions of dollars for downtown parking lots, and the more they build, the more we need. It's like emptying the ocean with a teaspoon. Every one of these steps has encouraged more and more private car operators to drive downtown, making things worse than ever before. So now, our city centers have reached the saturation point. City area dwellers suddenly have to face the fact that it is no longer practical for everyone to drive his own car everywhere he wants to go. The right to drive bumps into the hard facts of geography when it comes to driving downtown. What's the answer then? Prohibit private cars? Naturally, city planners are not thinking of eliminating private cars from city streets. They realize that some business and professional men need their cars for their work. But there are a great many others, such as commuters and shoppers, who really don't need their cars downtown. Who could help both themselves and their community by using public transportation for trips into the central district and their private cars for trips outside the congested areas. By combining private car use with public transportation, they will enjoy maximum freedom of movement. As more motorists make use of bus transportation, they'll also realize that the precious right of way on our public streets should be divided among people, not vehicles. Even today, most of the people who come downtown to work or shop in our largest cities travel by public transportation. Because the streets are choked with private cars, those who make the trip daily by means of street transportation lose an entire hour out of their lives, 250 hours a year. The traffic congestion adds greatly to the cost of their transportation. And it's important to remember that bus riders are taxpayers too. Through ownership of property and the payment of multiple taxes, they contribute their full share to the public treasury. Yes, they pay for the streets, too. But they are penalized in both time and money because public streets are used as stable yards for private automobiles. And when the stable yard overflows, bus riders are asked to help pay for public garages at $4,000 a stall. This 250-car public parking lot, for instance, represents a $1 million investment for the taxpayers. Its ability to earn a satisfactory return is questionable. Yet the people who drive these cars, plus the passenger that rides in every fourth car, could easily be seated in seven modern motor coaches with 44 seats to spare. Bus riders should not be penalized at all. By using buses, they are helping to relieve traffic congestion. The bus rider is not nearly such a financial burden on the city as the motorist. The large capacity motor coach is the most efficient mover of large numbers of people because it carries as many seated passengers 
as 34 private automobiles with an average of only 1.5 persons per car. Because of its flexibility, it is the only form of mass transportation that fits into the pattern of this automotive age, capable of maximum legal speeds. It can make use of the same entrances, exits, and traffic lanes as other vehicles. It can move right along with the other traffic. of convenient low-cost turnouts, local buses can get safely out of the way while loading and unloading on high-speed expressway. Bus travel on expressways increases the usefulness of these thoroughfares it has been found that when buses comprise 1% of total expressway traffic, they raise the expressway's carrying capacity by 25%. 4% usage would double an expressway's capacity. Above all, the motor coach needs no fixed right of way. Routes can be added or changed overnight. So, at long last, city planners everywhere do have a way out. First, they emphasize the movement of people rather than vehicles. Second, they base their plans on the mobility and freedom of the modern motor coach. Under this new concept, street parking should be prohibited anywhere in the heart of the city. Every inch of street space should be reserved for the movement of people and goods. Here we see this system already in effect in Philadelphia. And here it is in Toledo, where the elimination of street parking has speeded up all traffic. Under this traffic planning, private cars should be permitted to pause only at designated loading zones, and then only long enough to pick up or discharge passengers. Public transportation should have top priority on downtown curb lanes for maximum speed and convenience in moving people. Whether protected bus stops such as this, capable of accommodating numerous people, can be built by the city for a fraction of the cost of one stall in a municipal parking lot. It is practical to set aside certain traffic lanes exclusively for buses. Here, in Nashville, Tennessee, this system has been an unqualified success. And now, Newark has exclusive lanes for buses. may even be possible to set aside whole streets for the exclusive use of the bus riders. And remembering that one big bus moves as many people as 34 passenger cars, city officials should encourage bus companies to make greater use of the expressway. In fact, bus turnouts should be incorporated into the design of expressways at transfer points and heavy loading stations. Passengers load at convenient boarding points along the suburban end of the line. Then, the bus becomes a non-stop express to downtown, traveling swiftly on the expressway. A 
A typical express run goes like this. And the passengers arrive downtown in less time than a motorist can drive the same route and park his car. There are also other attractive alternatives in the future for the car owner who lives away from the heart of the city. This is perimeter parking, already in effect in St. Louis, Cleveland, and other cities. Here's how it's working in St. Louis. Dad drives off to work 15 to 30 minutes later than he used to leave. He drives in free-moving traffic until he is within a few miles of the heart of the city. He parks his car in a municipal parking lot where the cost per stall to the taxpayer is considerably less due to lower real estate value than the same space downtown. On the bus, he will buy a park ride ticket for 35 cents. This is less than the cost of parking just two hours downtown. 35 cents covers parking and the round trip express ride. He gets on the express bus. They leave at five minute intervals. The driver gives him a ticket and a token. The token operates a meter which opens the automatic gate when he leaves the lot at night. He has time to scan the headlines. And within eight or 10 minutes, instead of 15 or 20 in the midst of nerve wracking traffic, he steps off the coat in the heart of the city, a few feet from his destination, perhaps only the width of the sidewalk. Given a share of street space in proportion to the number of people it serves, public transportation can again become fast and convenient so that more and more people take the bus downtown. The transit company, aware of its obligation to the community and equally aware of competition from private motor cars, sees to it that the service is good, that buses are clean, comfortable, and attractively modern. Having more street space in which to operate, bus riding becomes more attractive. Now a good chain reaction is underway. As a result of increased patronage, service is increased. Because there is less automobile traffic, schedules can be speeded up, new routes added, more and better equipment put into service. With such features as the ultra smart new interiors, wonderful vibration-free comfort of air suspension. And one of these days, the cool refreshment of hot weather air conditioning. Transit operators who are anxious to give the best service possible, consistent with a fair profit, could do a far better job if relieved of outdated, burdensome taxes and regulations that hang over from years ago when public transit was a monopoly and the only means of travel for just about everybody. Today, revenues which might be used for improvements must often be paid out for taxes that should, in the interests of the bus riding public, be reduced or eliminated entirely. State after state today is reducing the various taxes and license fees imposed on bus companies in an effort to keep them in business. All the blue states on this map have given badly needed tax relief of one sort or another to operators of city motor coach systems. Still others, shown in red, are now considering relief. 
many cities also are reducing or eliminating local taxes on their transit companies. An efficient bus system is vital to the welfare of any community. Merchants especially have a big stake in public transportation. It was discovered at Columbus that each tra transit vehicle brings $500,000 worth of retail business downtown annually and without the merchant having to provide parking. Any city that wants to end its central traffic congestion can do the job almost overnight, especially with the help of the state and other regulatory bodies. What's more, it can be done almost for free. Stop letting our downtown streets be used as stable yards. Overnight, you have the equivalent of a multi-million dollar street widening. Let the cities reinvigorate their transit systems by giving them street space in which to operate efficiently. Let them recognize that half of the people rely on public transportation and are entitled to a proportionate share of the street space, including exclusive streets and exclusive curb lanes for buses. Let bus companies be taxed no more than other companies doing the same dollar volume of business. By all rights, they should be taxed less because they reduce the need for more and more costly street projects. Talking, writing, or wishing about the downtown traffic jam will not solve the problem. Bad as it is today, it will be worse tomorrow if more and more cars are encouraged to jam their way into the heart of the city. Our best hope for solving the problem is getting shoppers and commuters back into buses. Then, instead of merely moving vehicles, we'll be moving people. This is the simple, practical, inexpensive, immediately available solution.